So tonight, we're really fortunate to have uh, Andy Parsikian from the University of Wyoming. Uh, Andy received his uh, BS from Dickinson College in 2005, to PhD from Rutgers University, Newark in 2011. Following that, uh, he uh, completed a postdoctoral assistantship at Stanford University, and then he came directly to uh, the Department of Geology and Geophysics at the University of Wyoming, where he currently works as an associate professor. His primary re research interests are related to environmental geophysics and focus on permafrost processes and alpine hydrology. Uh, as a result of his expertise, uh, Andy has uh, had a number of federally funded grants and, and has produced more than 40 publications in peer reviewed scientific journals. He regularly teaches classes at the, both the undergraduate and the graduate level on geophysical principles and applied geophysical methods. So we're really fortunate to have Andy here with us tonight. With uh, Having seen some of the previous slides, I think you're really going to enjoy the scenery uh, as well as the talk. So without further ado, Andy, you're on. Great. Thanks a lot, John. Let me just make sure I get the right one shared here. Take my business. All right, so yeah, thanks again for inviting me. I think um, hopefully a talk about a cold place in the middle of a warm summer will be a nice refreshing uh, thing to do this evening. Um, so with that, I, I would like to welcome everyone to Alaska's North Slope. That's the photo you're looking at here. And this is gonna be the setting for my talk today, primarily on how lakes in permafrost regions are important in the context of climate change. And also how we use geophysics to understand our, um, to improve our understanding of this system. So as I said, the image you're seeing here is from the North Slope. This is of Alaska. This is a pretty typical scene from the field. Um, what you're looking at is we're actually stopped in the middle of a frozen lake, not too far south from the Arctic Ocean. Um, so really flat, really frozen. This is in the middle of spring, um, probably late April, I guess we, it was. Um, and what we're doing is we're setting up a geophysical instrument to measure the permafrost below a lake. So this is the sort of background image you can have in your mind of what everyday life looks like on the tundra when we're working there as I go through my talk. Before I go too much farther, I just want to acknowledge uh, my collaborators and several of my students who have contributed um, immensely to the work that I'm going to talk about, as well as National Science Foundation um, for funding all of this work and our partners at the U Piagvik in Upiak Corporation, who are who have been invaluable for logistics and literally rescuing us <laughs> from time to time, um, and so we we really like want to um, acknowledge and thank them for allowing us to to do research on their um, homelands. So I in that we'll focus on lakes and their surroundings. Um, so here are some uh, some of the questions that we're going to specifically be interested in in getting a better handle on. Um, so how deep Permafrost thaw um, below. How deep permafrost thaws below lakes uh, in in the in the Arctic environment? Um, how does permafrost thaw below lakes promote ancient methane release from uh, permafrost? And what happens to to the permafrost after lakes drain? And of course, important most importantly, why does this all matter? Why do we care in the mid latitudes here about what's going on in the Arctic, particularly related to these surface hydrology systems? Um, so the depth of permafrost is simple. Any ground that's below freezing for two or more consecutive years, you know, it could be a rock, could be soil, whatever it is, if it's frozen for two or more consecutive years, it's permafrost. And so the image you're looking at here is a, a relatively dramatic picture showing one of my collaborators, Roger, in the northern foothills of the Brooks Range, Alaska. And you can see behind him, there's what looks like essentially a massive ice layer just below the surface. And so this is a pretty extreme example. And most permafrost does not look like this with just pure ice below ground. But I like this picture because it lets you actually see underground because of how the soil has heaved here. Um, in the Arctic, permafrost is distributed on land and under the ocean um, at all high latitudes, but also at, at also at high altitude. So we'll be focusing here in this uh, box here in the northern part of Alaska. But there are, of course, wide expanses of permafrost throughout the north that have similar processes and landforms associated with them. Of course, for a little bit of context here in the lower 48, we do have a little bit of permafrost here, um, right here in Wyoming, and it it's, tends to be in the high elevations um, and on, uh, you know, associated with north-facing slopes. 
So why does this matter in a big picture sense? So as, as Earth's climate warms, there's a lot of reasons that we care about thawing permafrost. Um, permafrost thaw is related to the carbon cycle um, and particularly how carbon dioxide and methane are released from um, the, the ground, which has unknown climate impacts. We're starting to get a little bit of a handle on them. Um, there's some pronounced geomorphological and hydrological changes. Um, you saw a geomorphological change in that uh, previous photo of Roger with the permafrost heave. That's an example of that. Uh, and we'll talk some, about some of the hydrological changes um, related to lakes today. Terrestrial and aquatic ecology are affected by permafrost thaw. There's a lot of engineering impacts. Um, on the bottom uh, left side, there's a picture of an oil spill that happened because permafrost thawed and it, uh, it compromised the integrity of an oil tank. And this happened in Siberia uh, last summer. And there's even some even you know, substantially more scary stuff like geo health risks. Um, so there have been recorded um, some permafrost thaw related to anthrax being released from what was frozen permafrost and infecting caribou herds in Siberia. Um, so yeah, fortunately not a lot of people living right around there, but you can imagine that if we're mobilizing diseases that have been, you know, frozen away for, for millennia, that's, that's a pretty important thing. So we really care about permafrost thaw, even if you're not living on permafrost. So there's lots of lines of evidence for documenting the impact of climate change on the Arctic, but let's just focus on these two data sets as kind of an example first. So on the left, um, we're showing the global and Arctic temperature anomalies over the past 120 years. And on the right is the, the change in ground temperatures over a 30 year period ending 2010. So importantly, we can see that the effect of climate change on air temperature is substantially larger in the Arctic relative to Earth as a whole. So you can see the red line is sort of, it has an excursion substantially above the global um, climate warming anomaly. Um, in part, this is likely caused because of changes in albedo and ice recede. Um, though there's, we think that there's also some, um, can be attributed partially to alterations in weather patterns that could have a, a, an effect of where the air is moved around at global scales. So since around the 1980s or 90s, we've seen also that permafrost at 10 to 20 meters below ground, and so that's what we're looking at here on the right side. So this is this is deep permafrost is starting to warm, and and colder permafrost tends to warm faster. So this is a pretty tangible way to think about how climate change is directly leading to warmer or thawing permafrost. So permafrost near the ground surface is going to be the most sensitive to interannual weather and climate and is vulnerable, but deep permafrost should generally be protected from short-term variability. So one warm winter or a hot summer, right? Um, so what we wanna think about is places where we have actively deep permafrost thawing and what are the implications of that? So where does deep permafrost thaw? Well, as the title of the talk already probably spoiled it, this is lakes. So lakes are a part of a really important natural permafrost degradation process, um, particularly in these, the flatter lowland permafrost landscapes that are really dominated by what we call thaw lakes. So what you're looking at here is a, a thaw lake. It's also called a thermokarst lake. Um, and these occur as a direct result of permafrost thaw. Um, the permafrost thaws at the surface, it subsides, and then it floods as the sediments subside. And so these lakes come in all shapes and sizes. This is a kind of an average sized one about a kilometer across, but you can see there's tons of little tiny ponds. And of course the world's largest thermokarst lake is about 26 miles across, I think. So a um, whole range of shapes and sizes. So where do they come from? I mentioned this was a, a natural process and it's a, I think it's a fascinating process actually. And this is a graphic here that um, I'm using, I'm gonna use to illustrate what causes these lakes to form under nat natural conditions. So it can start with any disturbance, any little sort of micro or macro disturbance from a tundra fire to something as small as changes in how the snow drifts accumulate in the winter. And so this might lead to some local permafrost degradation causing a small pond to form. And this eventually leads to expansion of small ponds into bigger ponds as, as chunks of ice in the ground um, and permafrost melt at, near the ground surface. So then, the, as I mentioned, the ground surface subsides and floods, and through time you end up growing these 
lakes on the tundra. So they initiate with a little disturbance, but that the, the fact that water is sitting there on the ground surface and it has a really high specific heat capacity allows it to suck, uh, to basically put heat into the permafrost and thaw, throb vertically and horizontally. So here we'll just look at, at one lake in this thaw lake process. So we've, we've developed a pond and it started to expand. Um, so I've, I've said this word a couple of times, I suppose I should define it a little bit better. So thermokarst um, is, de is derived from the word karst, you know, related to carbonate dissolution. But instead of chemical reactions dissolving rock, this is melting ice within permafrost. So a, a thermokarst lake thaws and expands both laterally, right? So in the direction of the blue arrow here, but also vertically into the permafrost. And so this bulb of unfrozen sediments as it propagates down, this thawing front propagates down into the permafrost, it is essentially um, remobilizing uh, sediments that had been de deposited tens of thousands of years ago or longer. In some places, this includes some really carbon rich sediments. So the way you can think of it is that these thermocarst lakes are tapping into really old carbon reservoirs, sort of Pleistocene age carbon reservoirs, potentially making it bioavailable to be converted into methane through bacterial decomposition. And that methane then migrates vertically through the, um, the thaw bulb into the lake water column where it's released as bubbles and makes its way into the atmosphere. So in some cases, the methane travels up through the lake water column into these hot spots, and in, in the winter, it's trapped as it's trapped in the ice. So in this this animation, this video of my former PhD student Andrea, um, she is punching her, the the probe into the into one of these hot spots. You can basically walk around on the lake surface, brush the, brush the snow away, and you see some bubbles frozen in there. So we see the bubbles, get out a blowtorch, and then um, and then breach it and. Yeah, we're just really confirming that this is methane gas in those because if it was uh, if it was just carbon dioxide, it wouldn't light there. Um, I'm sorry. Let's see if I can get that to go one more time. It looks like I can't. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, nope. Sorry. Uh, you have to go back to the recorded video. So. What we the important thing here is that we're seeing lakes on the permafrost surface, and they are this essentially this conduit for moving carbon from permafrost that's thawed through the lake water column into the atmosphere. So they're really important. So they don't it's they don't only act to enhance deep permafrost thaw and mobilize that all that old carbon. That's more they're important, but it's actually really important that the gas travels quickly to the atmosphere through the lake water column. So most of the gas that's emitted through the tundra, so through the soil and vegetation, um, has time to oxidize into carbon dioxide, which is which is much less important of a, or much less potent of a greenhouse gas. Certainly an important greenhouse gas, but um, methane is about twenty times better at trapping heat than CO two. So because the the gas is moving from the permafrost into the atmosphere very quickly, in a matter of seconds or maybe a minute through the lake water column. Um, without oxidizing, lakes are preferentially uh, emitting um, a methane to the atmosphere and, and causing that enhanced um, potential for warming. So about 50% of by volume of the gas released is, is methane. So we, when we look at methane concentrations of the atmosphere, um, we see, of course, that they're rising. This um, plot from NOAA shows the, uh, the trend since the 1980s. Um, and the real question here, the sort of biggest picture question, why we care about permafrost and, uh, sorry, lakes in the permafrost um, carbon cycle is, what is the role of these lakes in contributing to this global observed increase in atmospheric methane concentration? And so you can see there's some pretty, in, pretty alarming trends. Uh, you know, uh, this is um, pretty recent. I think this is, uh, I pulled this just back in February. So this is basically as modern as it gets. And, um, methane concentrations are, are increasing at an accelerating rate, so something we need to be aware of and, and trying to puzzle together, you know, what the different sources for that are is, is what we're looking at doing here. Okay, so what is, you know, what is the contribution that we know about so far? So overall, it seems that thermokarst lakes probably account for about a third of the non-wetland natural methane emissions right now. 
Um, however, the problem is that these estimates are really poorly constrained and the likely reality is that methane emissions from thermal karst lakes are probably quite a bit higher than that. Um, and the reason that they're so poorly constrained is because it's uh, methane emissions from permafrost tend to be really variable in space and time. So you don't necessarily know where to measure or when to measure in order to, to estimate your methane fluxes from permafrost regions. So um, that's kind of one of the things we're trying to, to do here is to learn a little bit more about that so we can better constrain these estimates of, uh, of, of uh, methane releases from permafrost lakes. So I think at this point, I've made the case for why Arctic lakes are imp generally important, but I wanna give you a quick tour of the Northern Alaska Arctic. So you can get a sense for how abundant these lakes are, right? So really cool process, really interesting how these lakes form and mobilize old carbon. But if there's only one lake in the middle of Alaska, well, why do we care? But I think um, I think if by taking this little, animated tour, you can see that we are not talking about one lake or 10 lakes or 100 lakes. There are tens and tens of thousands of these lakes um, at all scales across um, massive regions, lowland regions of the Alaskan Arctic and indeed throughout the entire circumpolar Arctic. Um, and so you can see as we zoom in here, all of these darker greenish patches are lakes. Um, these ones have this interesting sort of almost cat eye appearance because there's some sandy littoral shelves on the sides that are shallower. Um, the rivers are these sort of uh, yellow lines. It's all sediment bars that are deposited there. In the middle of your screen now is the world's largest thermal karst lake. It's called Teshik Puk Lake. Um, and you can actually also see some of these um, kind of lake-shaped browner spots. And those are actually drained lake basins. We'll talk a bit about that later too. Um, but yeah, so I think that you can get a sense for there's a huge part of, uh, percentage of the landscape, uh, upwards of 40% of the land surface um, in some of these regions is lakes, and then it's above 70% that is lakes or drained basins. So it's a massive part of the land surface that's occupied by, um, by lakes. And so just to give you a, a different view of that, right? So now we're looking at the, we're looking down onto the North Pole, the entire circum, um, circumpolar Arctic. And what we've done here is we've classified all lake and drained lake basin, uh, basin regions. So these are, these are regions that have this characteristic of being relatively flat lowland regions that tend to accumulate these really high densities of thermocarst slates. So the red here, it's sort of brownish red, indicates those lake and drained lake regions. And this is about a fifth of the circumpolar Arctic by area. And that includes modern lakes or historic lakes that are now represented by uh, drained lake basins. However, not all lakes are created equal. So some are primarily responsible for deep permafrost thaw, while others are not. And so this distinction is made by lakes that are shallow enough that they freeze all the way to the bottom by the end of spring. And those are called bedfast ice lakes. Um, and there's a different class that are deep enough that they always have some liquid water. Even in the middle of winter, when there's two meters of ice on the lake, they have a little bit of water at the bottom or maybe quite a bit of water. And those are called floating ice lakes. Um, and so by far, most of the lakes tend to be about two meters deep, some a bit less and some slightly more. Um, but just because of how the, the, the permafrost thaw process works, um, you just tend to have this lake depth of about two meters. So with the ice thickness, it, depending on the season, being roughly two meters, the farther north you go a little bit more, the farther south you go a little bit less, um, you're, you're often right on the edge of this bedfast versus floating ice regime. So what we really care about in terms of permafrost thaw is floating ice lakes because they contribute to that permafrost degradations. They have that layer of water with high specific heat capacity that's moving heat into the permafrost year round. Whereas the bedfast ice lakes have much less, if any, permafrost thawing capacity because Early in the winter, the lake, the lake water will freeze all the way to the bottom, and then you're actually moving the, the cold um, atmospheric temperatures down into the permafrost and preserving the permafrost. Um, in between these two end members, there are some lakes that have a depth right at near that maximum ice thickness boundary, and therefore some years they're floating ice and some years they're bedfast ice, and we call these transitional ice lakes. So hypothetically, as climate warms, we anticipate to see thinner ice, 
So therefore more floating ice and transitional lakes and ultimately more permafrost thaw. Um, and so the, the, the animation here on the left is uh, drilling into a, a floating ice lake. It, this is actually a little bit disingenuous. Um, this, there's a special case with some ice pressure and snow pressure that's causing the water to fountain out. It doesn't normally do that, but I think it's a nice sort of dramatic way to show how much uh, water is underneath the, the ice. And then, yeah, bedfast ice lakes aren't nearly as, as exciting, but um, yeah, this is kind of what happens when you core into one with a, you know, an ice coring drill. Um, you get a little bit of snow on top, a little bit of lake ice, and then right into the permafrost, frozen totally to the bottom. Uh, so this brings us to the role of these lakes in permafrost carbon feedback. And I've sort of alluded to this, but I'll try and formalize it now. So we think that in, you know, in, a, in a warmer climate scenario, you'll have thinner maximum ice and a shorter ice growth period each winter and spring. Um, that will lead to lakes changing from bedfast to floating ice, which will either initiate new talic or you'll have um, you know, a faster rate of thermocar subsidence. Uh, so by by making more lakes and more permafrost uh, thaw. That's going to allow access to carbon stocks that have been isolated for tens of thousands of years, which leads to methanogenesis and methane gas releases, enhances that climate forming, climate forcing, uh, and therefore we get back to the beginning of our cycle, a warmer climate. So this is potentially a um, what you call a runaway feedback type cycle. So how deep is the thaw below lakes and permafrost environments? And we really care about this because this is directly related to how much um, carbon we could potentially be remobilizing, right? Um, and, and one of the first people to do this was in, in Barrow, Alaska, as it call, was called at the time. The town is now called Ikiavik. Um, and this was a, a USGS uh, scientist named Max Brewer. And he basically took a big drill rig into the middle of a lake and just drilled a big hole and stuck a, a, a bunch of thermometers down it to see how deep the permafrost uh, was. Um, what this, I mean, this is a really valuable experiment and what it really showed us was that it's extremely uh, resource intensive to be able to measure the, the, the thickness of the talic below these lakes if you have to get a truck and a drill rig out there. Um, so, you know, in the past 60 years, uh, maybe a handful, maybe like seven different lakes have had this type of measurement made on it with, uh, with a direct drilling type treatment. Um, so how do we get around that? Well, um, we try and to, to, to estimate therm, uh, permafrost thickness and, and talic thickness using geophysical measurements. So we can measure the change in physical properties between thawed permafrost and frozen permafrost, or thawed permafrost being the talic and frozen permafrost. Um, and one way we do that is with what we call nuclear magnetic resonance, and the other ways is, is with uh, a time domain electromagnetics. And so nuclear magnetic resonance is the same physics as you find in um, medical MRI imaging. So the cool thing about NMR is that it is uh, directly sensitive to liquid water. And so in that case, if we use an NMR measurement, then we are, um, we're, we're looking for that change in water content between the frozen permafrost, which has essentially very, very low you know, liquid water content and the talic, which is gonna be basically the saturated aquifer. Um, the time domain electromagnetics is, is a relatively um, mature method at this point, basically uses the principles of induction and it measures resistivity. So the ability of the material to conduct an electric current or resist an electric current. And so again, in permafrost, electric current doesn't flow very well because it's frozen, whereas in the talic um, or thaw bulb, it will, it will flow. And so there we can measure the difference between those in order to estimate that thickness of thaw below the lakes. So I'm not going to get into the nuances of these methods. I'll be happy to chat about them later if you'd like to. Um, but uh, yeah, kind of based, basically both based on induction principles with NMR having that ex extra advantage of being directly sensitive to liquid water. Um, so yeah, basically we just go on to all the work. Here it is. So we are uh, we go into the middle of a lake. And again, here we are uh, standing in the middle of the lake. And um, since they're both kind of in measurements that are based on induction principles, we have to lay out a, a huge induction coil. In this case, it's a, it's, a, it's a 90 meter circle of wire in order to do this um, induction measurement. And um, yeah, it works great on a, on, a, on a nice day on a thermocarst lake because it's perfectly flat. It's easy to lay out a large coil of wire. Uh, we do work in all conditions. This is the Arctic, let's be realistic. It's not all sunny days. So here I am uh, hunkering under a, a tarp, trying to get a 10 measurement and a ground blizzard. The wires are all laid off to the right side. 
Um, but certainly, uh, you know, it's not all uh, sunny days and, and suntanning up there. So we also use a variety of remote sensing measurements to map large areas of the Arctic. Um, for example, satellite-based radar platforms allow us to determine is, if the lake is bedfast or floating ice based on how the energy transmitted is reflected from the interface between lake ice and water, or if it's frozen to the bottom, there'll be lake ice and permafrost. And so this is super important for understanding permafrost thaw because the very shallow lakes um, with ice frozen to the bottom would not be associated with sublake permafrost thaw, as I mentioned. So we use this data ahead of time to be able to target either bedfast ice or floating ice lakes or transitional ice lakes um, that are just around the tipping point of going from bedfast to floating ice. And so you can see it, this is uh, an example of one of these radar images where we look at this backscatter um, data and we can then classify the lakes as floating ice or bedfast ice lakes simply depending on essentially the color of, uh, of the return signal. So let's start out by looking at, at an example of what the NMR results tell us. So here we're trying to measure the thickness of uh, thawed permafrost below the lake. And in both plots, the vertical axis is depth and the horizontal axis is volumetric water content. Um, so first we compare the bedfast ice lakes to the floating ice lakes. And we see exactly what we would expect. On the left is a bedfast ice lake and there's yeah, no measurable liquid water. So no permafrost thaw. In contrast, the floating ice lakes have lots of liquid water below them. Um, which indicates that deep thaw as we would expect. So no huge surprises here. Uh, basically this change in water content um, around 20 meters is actually related to a sediment, um, sedimentary change. So it's unconsolidated uh, in the top 15 to 20 meters and then uh, sandstone below that. Um, but plenty of water throughout the water, uh, throughout the, the depth column here. When we add the transitional ice lakes into the picture, we can see a little bit more interesting of a story. So these lakes spend most of their time as bedfast ice lakes, but they have a very they have these variable sort of lobes of thaw at depth. And so we think this is because of multi-year variations in this lake ice regime that cause pulses of heat to penetrate the permafrost and cause these sort of layers of thaw, followed by a refreeze period, followed by thaw, um, which results in some sort of you know, interesting you know, thaw structures below the lake. So you can see, for example, in the blue one, there's this sort of more thawed zone, and then it probably is this frozen layer again, and then back to a thawed zone. Um, and so, yeah, that kind of suggests that they may have long periods that they spend maybe on the order of decades as bedfast or floating ice lakes, depending on the, the trends in, uh, um, in, in, in annual uh, ice thickness. So those were just sort of 1D, uh, 1D soundings that we call them, but it's almost like basically looking like a, looking at a well. Um, we're also looking at these um, 2D images of Lake Talix to test ideas about how lateral lake expansion chains in, chain, uh, translates into how the subsurface thaws. So we see that on the lake margins that expand slowly, the extent of bed fast ice is large and the slope of the thaw bulb is, is really steep. So that's like on the top one here. Um, well, on quickly expanding shorelines, so like on the bottom one, uh, there's this there's relatively little bedfast ice, and the slope of the talic is more shallow. Um, and basically, it's because the lake is expanding fast enough; it's just expanding, you know, more quickly to the um, outside of the the lake margin. Um, so yeah, we can use this sort of two D imaging to get a sort of a picture of what the thaw wall looks like below. Um, below these lakes, get an estimate of total thickness, but you can also, of course, extrapolate this into a volumetric estimate. Um, still a fairly time-consuming measurement to make, uh, but it's much less you know, intensive than trying to drill this a similar number of holes. So let's take a step back again and think about how these lakes fit into the context of Arctic climate change. So if we look at the mean annual lake bed temperature, we see that the shallow lakes are warming nearly three times faster than deeper lakes, right? So the shallow lakes are the red line here. And what you can see is that um, for deep lakes, the floating ice lakes, they are warming, but much less, uh, much less quickly. And, and that's pretty important because the, 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 that seems to indicate there's a higher likelihood that more of these lakes will transition into, into floating ice lakes and then tap into additional carbon that's currently sequestered. So a shift in lake ice regime from bedfast to floating may lead to more talics being formed. 
which could result in more old carbon being mobilized and therefore potentially enhancing that permafrost carbon feedback. Um, it also may lead to more lake drainages, which we'll talk about in a couple of upcoming slides. Um, so we may have this sort of superficial view of the Arctic as this massive frozen wasteland, almost like a glacier in the earth. But in reality, I think it's a little bit more like Swiss cheese with an extensive patchiness of thaw that's largely obscured underground. So the next question I want to talk about is how permafrost thaw below lakes promotes ancient car uh, methane release. And um, I'll come back to this same diagram here. And we talked about, this is what we've talked about so far, is you have permafrost thaw that mobilizes old carbon, and you have some, some anaerobic decomposition of this Pleistocene-ish aged carbon by microbes. Um, but let's add another sort of element to this. So in some cases, the lake may cause permafrost thaw such that it, it penetrates the permafrost layer entirely. So um, this is what we would call a through-going talic, one that entirely um, connects the surface with the bottom of the permafrost. And so this becomes then a pathway for ancient carbon from geologic reservoirs to, um, to escape into the atmosphere. And we call this ancient because it's essentially radiocarbon dead or too old to be measured with, with carbon dating. Um, and what it is really is that you had some, you know, coal or methane hydrate or natural gas reservoir below the surface, and it was effectively capped in by the permafrost, right? And so now that the, we breach that cap with the lake, it, it allows some of that, um, that gas to be released through the lake. So here's an example of one of these lakes that we've been working on recently. And uh, in this particular lake, there is so much methane being vented through the lake in the winter even. Water looks like it's boiling and prevents ice from forming. So you can see that top picture is actually a photo of the lake from an airplane in the winter. And you know the rest of the lake might have a meter of ice on it, but it's so violently boiling methane out of it that those um, dark spots in the center are, are left ice free because uh, the can't, uh, water can't freeze. So in this particular lake, it amounts to uh, about 1.2 kilograms of methane per meter squared per day with a maximum observed flux rate of nearly 24 kilograms per meter squared per day of methane. And, and right now, we just published this paper this year. It actually says in revision, but I forgot to update that. This paper was just published. And currently, as far as we know, this is the world's highest flux natural methane vent. Um, so it's, a, it's an extremely important uh, you know, thing to understand how lakes are contributing to this, this level of methane release into the atmosphere. So from the geophysical perspective, we use the same 2D imaging approach as we looked at before. Um, here, the, the bluer uh, colors are, in, are indicating um, thawed permafrost and yellow is more frozen or, or permafrost. Um, and what we can see is sort of in the center of that lake, there's this, um, the, the colors dull down a bit, suggesting partial thaw through the, through the lake. And we're interpreting this as a conduit where uh, methane might be released from um, in this area, it's probably a coal bed methane type, uh, type source um, deep below the surface. So in this case, we think that geology and permafrost degradation are working together to funnel what is likely, um, you know, this ancient methane from faults up through the permafrost out of the lake and into the atmosphere. And so they, we have this kind of conceptual diagram um, where you have some kind of faulting in the system and you have this, this permafrost cap and the, the lake right here in the center is causing thaw that is uh, sort of activating pathways where that methane can um, move from this, you know, this fault system into, uh, into the lake and then vent into the atmosphere. Um, so this image that I just put up here is actually uh, a, a radar image. Um, and it's a, um, what we're showing is just, it's basically the lake bottom, but you get to see a little bit into the lake bottom. So the, the bottom of the water column is this, the top of the sort of black and gray. And then you can see that there's some, some layering um, below the surface. And you can see that the sort of bathymetry of inside this, this crater effectively that's spewing out methane. 
Um, and so it kind of, the, the sort of layering on the sides of this vent almost resemble uh, an ejecta cone, right? Where you have um, gases sort of bubbling out of the middle, but they're so violently bubbling that they're moving the sediment outwards as well. Um, and so this is kind of just, you know, in, an incidental image that's, that's interesting, but it kind of shows the, the magnitude of the, the vent of, uh, the, uh, in this lake here. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is um, what happens after lake strain. And we sort of mentioned that these thermal karst, uh, this, these lakes happen in, in a process where they grow and expand through time. And drainage is simply the natural end point of what we call the thaw lake cycle. And it's effectively triggered once lakes expand laterally enough that they intersect something else, some other topographic low point that causes the water to spill out of the lake and then leaves a dry basin behind. So an individual lake may persist for tens or hundreds or thousands of years, um, but in most cases, they eventually uh, meet some other surface feature that enables drainage. So what kind of things can uh, enable drainage? So here are some of the things that we find cause drainage on the north, north slope of Alaska. Um, some kind of erosion that creates a small stream that you know, can drain the whole lake through a stream. You may have a lake that expands into a topographic low area. Um, sometimes it's a lake that's right next to it. That would, uh, sorry, a, uh, yeah, a lake or a basin that's right next to it and you have your, active, your lake actively thawing and it drains into the low point. Um, sometimes it's a river. Um, so as rivers meander, they will often intersect lakes and cause them to drain. Um, in some cases, we've seen coastal erosion. So the actual Arctic Ocean eroding, you know, landward um, will, will intersect lakes and cause drainage. And then even in some cases, we have um, human activities purposefully draining lakes. Um, it is actually also possible that as a lake thaws uh, vertically down into the permafrost, you can actually have that lake drain out the bottom almost like a bathtub. So in areas where you have thinner permafrost, um, sort of a bit south of the Brooks Range, then you can have this, uh, this vertical drainage phenomenon as well. So what happens after lake strain? So here in this, in this image here, what you're looking at are two lakes, or well, one current lake and one former lake. So on the left is a, uh, is a current lake, and on the right is a drained lake basin. And you can actually see in this case that um, the drained lake basin at one point drained into the lake on the left, and that probably drained farther to the left. We're not entirely sure about that. Um, but uh, yeah, you can kind of get an, Im an image in your mind here of how these lakes kind of eat each other up as they expand sidewards. Uh, so there's some really important changes to the surface and subsurface after a lake drains. So as permafrost aggrades or, or new permafrost forms, the volume of thawed set um, diminishes below these drained lakes, right? So you used to have this big thaw bulb and you can see it's kind of squeezing out here. So your, your methane um, that had been being released from the, the thaw bulb is now, is now frozen back in place. So your carbon source is shut off and you no longer have this pathway through the lake water column. So the carbon emissions mostly change from methane when it was a lake over to primarily carbon dioxide. There's also some changes to how surface sediments redistributed and um, because you no longer have or have sediment being redistributed about you know subaqueously throughout the lake um, but maybe you have some some sediment being distributed uh, through surface water movement through streams that might form in the uh, in the in the drain basin um, and now where you had been previously sequestering some carbon in the lake as lake sediments when the lake drains, you primarily start sequestering carbon as peat um, in, that's growing in the, in the lake basin. So we will look back here again at the north slope, just bring this, uh, the animation that we looked at before up again so you can see some of these lake basins. And so yeah, now that you're sort of looking at them, you can see that a huge amount of the landscape is covered with these, this, these lake basins and they're all sort of um, partially um, you know, merged into one another. And actually, the, as I mentioned, the world's largest th thermal karst lake here, Teshikpuk Lake, um, is simply the end member of joining many of these lakes up, uh, up together. You can see all these sub-lake basins that um, join. This just happens to be a topographic low point. Um, So 
okay, well, what's some other reasons that we care about lakes draining? Well, one reason is that they uh, have impacts beyond just geomorphology. So this is a really striking case that happened just a couple of years ago where a native Inupiat, where an, a, na a native Inupiat village um, lost their freshwater source because the lake that they had been using as uh, a drinking water source drained into the river. And so you can actually see the August 4th, uh, aerial photo on the left here and the September 8th aerial photo on the right here. And you can see that there, there's this um, new little stream that drained their entire drinking water source over the course of a few days. Um, and, you know, this, this village Point Lay, obviously it's right on the ocean here, right? So it's right on the coast of Northern Alaska. Um, they don't have that many, that many good choices for drinking water in the winter. And so it's really important to have um, lakes like this, and now they're searching for an alternative, right? So in the winter, the river doesn't run, it's all frozen, so you have to get the water from a lake. So they're kind of in a, in a stuck position right now until they sort out um, a better drinking water replacement. Um, so here's another example of a recent partial drainage event on the North Slope um, within the past, uh, I guess this was, yeah, about a year ago. Um, and so in this case, the lake intersected a river during the spring melt, and that dropped the um, the water level substantially. I, I don't think it, it. I don't think it ever completely drained. But what you can see on the satellite images on the left here is that the lake is frozen and full in June, uh, early June. By mid June, you can start to see there's a little bit. Um, well, I guess this is where the breach is going to happen. And then on the 25th of June, so just a few days later, you can actually see that there's this breach has formed and the lake then partially drains into the river. And so here's just, you know, the aerial photo from the plain, the oblique aerial. And so we're looking out and you can see that the lake has dropped um, maybe by half a meter in, in depth. Um, and so this is, I think, this hopefully animation works. Um, so here's another example of a partial drainage. You can see how quickly the lake can drain over the course of just a couple of days. And bear with the images. These are, um, so there's that drainage event happening there. And, uh, and then, so again, this is a partial drainage where the, the water level is just uh, reduced. Let's see if I can get it to play again. Will I be lucky this time? Oh, I got it to work. Cool, so full lake, full lake, full lake water's breached, and then in just a couple of days, you can see that the, the, the shoreline has receded considerably on the sides. So what is the projection for the future? So what do we think is gonna happen in terms of the number of lakes that we see and the number of drain lake basins that we see uh, under a warmer climate, future warmer climate? So we anticipate there's gonna be increased rate of lake drainage and a decreased rate of permafrost aggradation. So um, because we're warming the permafrost faster, there's going to be more cases where the lakes are going to find those opportunities to breach, and there's going to be decreased um, new permafrost. So this, this, we think, is going to result in some future shifts in the distribution, in, including an increase in smaller lakes. So that's over on the, the left side of this, uh, this diagram here. So this is kind of like a, a you know, frequency distribution. So we're going to see um, more new small lakes being initiated. Um, and then this, uh, so then we're going to see fewer large lakes, which are going to turn into drained lake basins. And we, we think that's going to happen because um, we think that the higher rates of lake drainage are going to be, are going to preferentially impact larger lakes just because they have a higher probability of, you know, intersecting some other surface feature because their coastline is longer simply, right? If you have a, a longer coastline, you're more likely to find a low point in the topography or a river or something else to drain into. Um, so those, these two parts of the curve sort of go hand in hand, the, the lower number of big lakes and the higher number of, of drain lake basins. Um, and of course, the, the ultimate effect of that uh, is that we are um, making some of the landscape drier, right? So if you have drain lake basins, some of the landscape is then, is then gonna, you know, not be inundated anymore. But you're also opening up new permafrost to, uh, to be thawed and to have that deep car that um, deep subsurface carbon remobilized. So in this part of the curve over on the left side here, that's sort of our warning zone because that's where we're remobilizing new carbon that we don't even know about it yet. We don't know how much, we don't know how fast. Um, you know, this is sort of, you know, potentially a, um, a stabilizing effect because you're then 
saying, okay, well, if the landscape is more dry, you'll be able to grade more permafrost. Um, and, but that's, this is very unknown how quickly those could possibly balance out. So in summary, um, lakes and permafrost environments um, are, are really important for mobilizing old carbon. Um, and I think that's one of the big takeaways I, I would hope that you think about is um, when we talk about lakes in the Arctic, um, the, I think the, the most important thing is that they're a really important pathway for tapping into Pleistocene age carbon that has not been in our carbon cycle for tens of thousands of years. Um, in addition to this old carbon that's only tens of thousands of years old, um, lakes can act as really important conduits for venting ancient carbon, ancient geologic uh, age methane um, from like coal bed methane or similar type reservoirs. And um, this is really important because it's uh, these points are so sporadically distributed, they're extremely poorly measured. So I talked in the beginning about how methane emissions from permafrost tend to be really patchy in space and time. This is a prime example. You only can find these when you happen to be lucky enough to basically stumble across them. So um, extremely poorly quantified. Um, Bedfast ice lakes on the tipping point of becoming floating ice lakes are showing some early evidence of permafrost thaw. So where we thought it might be kind of safe that hadn't started to thaw into the permafrost, actually based on our geophysical measurements, seem like they, they may be character areas where we're likely to have um, a really fast rate of thaw once they sort of tip past that um, point into becoming floating ice lakes permanently. And then finally, under future uh, warmer climate scenarios, we anticipate that we'll see more lakes draining, but also a lot more new lakes initiating potentially um, mobilizing additional carbon. So with that, I will uh, say thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to um, answer any questions. I hope I've been able to impress upon you uh, some of the value of, of geophysical measurements um, of lakes and permafrost regions, and maybe you've had some new uh, you know, insights yourself into the, the, freeze, the freeze and thaw processes that we see in the Arctic. Um, so with that, I will uh, open it up, or I don't know how you want to do this next part, but um, thanks again, John. Uh, Andy, I'll, I'll be asking the questions, and uh, this is Mike, and thank you. This is absolutely fascinating, uh, a topic I was largely ignorant of, and, and now I'm a little less ignorant. So uh, we have actually have quite you, a few questions. Uh, one of my questions would be, how do you know where the lake is when you're there in March and you're just on this big plane of snow? Great question. So there's, there's two ways. Um, the, the easy answer is prior planning, right? So we map everything out ahead of time. We go to the GPS point and we hope we're in the right spot. Uh, but actually when you're on this you know, incredibly flat landscape for weeks at a time, um, all of a sudden, eventually, uh, I don't know if I can get back here, the, uh, the, the slight nuances in the landscape become much more apparent. And something like a, a little 50 centimeter bump around the edge of the lake is something that you notice because it's the only hill for 10 miles. So uh, yeah, you, you kind of know where you are by, based on um, micro topography. Uh, so at the current rate of warming, how long will it take to basically melt all the permafrost in the Arctic? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, man, I have seen some numbers thrown out there and I'm gonna have trouble putting my finger on one of them, um, but it's, it's a long time. To, to, to thaw all the permafrost, it would be a, you know many centuries, um, we think, because it's deep. So the permafrost in Prudhoe Bay, where the most of the, um, oil exploration happens is about 600 meters thick, which is similar to the maximum thickness that you see in uh, Siberia. Uh, so that's going to take a really long time to get, you know, modern heat propagated down to that depth. Well, that question actually answered two questions because the, and I assume the thickness of the permafrost is related to latitude as well. Pri yeah, primarily to latitude. Yep. Uh, how long ago do you have to go back before you don't find permafrost on, on, on the earth? In other words, pre-Pleistocene, presumably, but could you elaborate? 
So, I mean, there always would have been some permafrost because you would have had um, topographic permafrost or elevation related permafrost, even if you didn't have um, uh, alt, uh, latitude related permafrost. So even in the Pleistocene, when we were sequestering all this carbon that's now sort of at the risk of being remobilized, there was actually glaciers in other places, just not here on the North Slope. And so it was, it was the activity of these glaciers doing all of this weathering and um, and a lot of aeolian redistribution of that weathered sediment, that was part of why all this carbon got sequestered back in the Pleistocene. So even then, there was no permafrost right here where we're standing, but there was glaciers somewhere, so there would have been permafrost somewhere as well. The Google Earth images that you displayed showed the lakes <clears throat> having a very much north-south orientation. And can you elaborate on on that and and also their sort of linearity yeah that is a a terrific question and i don't understand why my uh animation controls but so i can't get to that picture again very easily um okay so it's one of the most fascinating patterns in uh in in the arctic that geomorphologists have been fascinated with and we i have to uh give you some bad news we don't have a perfect answer um so one interesting thing is that the uh, orientation of the lakes, the long axis, is approximately perpendicular to the wind direction. So there's some effect where the wind is churning up the water in the lakes and redistributing sediment and heat and, and causing somehow this orientation of the lakes. Um, we, there's, there's several processes at work, though, because there's some um, fundamental thermal process that determines sort of this optimal um, sort of uh, volume that can be thawed uh, at a given time. But there's also mechanical permafrost thaw and, um, yeah, the wind and the, the, the lake water currents. So it's a complicated thing. We don't know exactly how it works. Um, they are elongated because of these erosion processes and they are oriented that way for some reason because of these erosion and wind processes but it's not fully fully known good it sounds like more research is needed it uh, is <laughs> yeah. so can you talk about uh extreme wildfires which i think we've heard about from more russia than the united states but also in the tundra yeah so um it's a, it's a huge deal and important for the lakes because we think that those types of events are big initiators for, for new lakes. Um, Alaska has lots of huge wildfires. Um, I, I've done some research on Alaskan wildfires uh, it's just south of the Brooks Range and then in the far southeast. Um, and they happen all the time. They don't really try and fight them because they're just far, far, far too remote. Um, you know, the key thing that we're interested in is, is it the change in albedo? Is that going to affect how much heat is absorbed by the permafrost in the summer? So you're turning a landscape that was once kind of light green into something that was, is, is now dark black after it gets burned. Um, or is it the difference in how snow is trapped on that landscape more important to permafrost though, right? So you all, you at once had these little bushes and shrubs and peat, and that was trapping snow one way. Once you scorch the landscape, now you have this much um, sort of smoother uh, topography. And, you know, it's, it's yeah, it remains to be seen. Um, but certainly Alaska has lots of big wildfires. Certainly the thing to, they're a thing to watch out for, um, mostly lightning caused. Yeah, I don't know if there's other specifics about wildfire in Alaska, but that's kind of what I can think of off the top of my head. Uh, <clears throat> when did these uh, lake, the, the Karst lakes begin to form? The, the ones you're studying, how, how old are they? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, people have dated a lot of them, and there's a big pulse of lake formation around 10,000 years ago. And I don't have the graphic, unfortunately, with me, but um, I can uh, I can share a link to a, a, a different talk that actually talks a lot more specifically about that, because that's something we're really interested in. You know, in the past, have we had these big pulses of lakes forming and are we going to expect to see something like that in the future? 
<clears throat> but um, yeah, so I don't have a specific number besides about 10,000 years ago, we had a big formation event. But what we do know is that it, they do sort of seem to happen episodically, right? You have this, this a lot of them are about the same age. Um, yeah, from what we've measured so far. Uh, <clears throat> are you collaborating with researchers from other Arctic countries? And are they doing similar studies so that you can compare what's going on in Siberia to Alaska to Norway and so on? For sure, yeah. Um, I uh, personally don't, so I, I collaborate with Russians who are now working here in America, but that doesn't really count. Um, so, but that's kind of the link that we have. It's a little bit tricky politically to go and and, and do research in Siberia for us. Um, although I do have some colleagues that, that act very actively do that. Um, and that's obviously the by far the most important other place um, besides, yeah, besides Canada, which is relatively easy to work in. Um, and yes, there's a really vibrant community around this of, of folks looking at, at lake dynamics. And um, there's some really interesting folks doing it uh, in Siberia. Um, yeah, that we, that we certainly talk with. Uh, so after you have a, a lake drain, can the permafrost reform and cap the, the carbon that's uh, still underneath there? Absolutely. Yeah. So that is, um, that's kind of the idea here on the right is that the, the brown is all reformed or a graded permafrost. Um, and so the idea is that once, you know, you've drained the lake, that's actually kind of a, you know, a good thing for us in the context of, of less potential to release additional carbon. You know, the caveat there is, as you can even see in this picture, is there's still usually some little ponds left in the lake basin after it's drained. And so they could still be carbon emitters. And you can also reflood a basin once it's already drained, if you have another, you know, basin nearby drain into it. So it's not a permanent you know, permanent cap, but absolutely by draining a lake, you are starting to regrow permafrost then. Has, <clears throat> has anyone thought to either flare the methane, for example, in the lake, you showed us the picture of where it was literally coming out, uh, you know, bubbling through the surface. Has anyone thought to either capture or flare that methane to turn it into CO2, which is <clears throat> possibly a less, uh, certainly less impactful on, on climate, uh, on heat trapping. Yeah, it's a great idea. I think, I wish it was a little bit more logistically possible, right? So this is a, this is super remote location here where, um, you know, it's, it's north of the town of Kotzebue and by town, I mean, it's a few hundred people that live there, <laughs> maybe a thousand people, right? So this is way out there. So in order to, that, to get the kind of infrastructure out to this site, to be able to flare the methane is expensive, dubious if it's even possible. And then you have to start thinking, well, okay, maybe I'm flaring the methane into CO2, but I'm also completely destroying the ecosystem of this lake. And so it's kind of a cost benefit analysis there. Um, you know, this was just basically discovered a few years ago. So maybe somebody will try and start doing that, or at least capturing it and selling it so we can, uh, you know, light up our stoves, whatever it might be. Um, but uh, I'm, nobody that I'm aware of is, is trying to act actively flare or stop or tap any of these natural sources. Right. Uh, <clears throat> do you see any additional or better satellite measuring techniques coming in that will allow you to assess the overall CO2 methane flux that you're, you're currently measuring? So yeah, they are, um, there is a new satellite launching called ICESAT, which is a synthetic aperture radar satellite. And, uh, oh, sorry, um, I don't think I have that right. It's not ICESAT, it's, uh, Oh no, it's in collaboration with India. I'm forgetting off the top of my head. But anyway, it's a synthetic aperture radar satellite. And so those tend to be good for uh, measuring changes in the Earth's surface. And so that's definitely something useful to us. There are some technologies where they can try to directly estimate the chemistry of the gas that's being released. And I'm not sure how well they do from satellites, but they do put those sensors on aircraft. And so recently we've been a part of a, an airborne, a NASA aircraft mission where they're flying a, 
you know, their Gulfstream jet with all these sensors on it. And, and so getting that sort of intermediate, um, you know, level of remote sensing sort of a little bit closer to the earth than a satellite um, is I think pretty transformative into our, in our ability to sort of map some of these interesting, um, yeah, methane sources. So can you talk a little bit about permafrost in the Southern hemisphere versus the Northern hemisphere uh, specifically, does Antarctica have permafrost or is it just, there's just too much ice that there isn't any available land to have it? Uh, someone mentioned Lake Vostok, which I'm not familiar with, but anyway, that, that would be the, the general question. Yeah, no, it's a great question. It's super interesting. Um, yeah, it's very interesting how, uh, the, how, how different the two poles are, right? Um, so it's Southern Hemisphere, the the zone where we would normally have the permafrost in the comparative comparable latitudes in the northern hemisphere is actually just ocean in the southern hemisphere, right? So Tierra del Fuego is the southern most southern real land mass in the uh, in the southern hemisphere, and it is uh, surrounded by ocean. It never gets cold enough to have permafrost. Maybe there's little alpine permafrost on the tops of the mountains there, but really nothing that we'd be super interested in. Once you get to Antarctica. Um, yeah, interesting there. It's actually not that cold at the bottom of the ice sheet because you have this geothermal heat flux that's me meaning, you know, making it so there's not really all that much. Um, it's not super cold at the bottom of the ice sheet. Um, however, the bigger thing that makes it not very interesting is that there's not much carbon in it, right? So it's a lot of just rock and, um, you know, low carbon rich sediments below the ice cap. So yeah, it would be sad, I suppose, if it thawed. However, it also wouldn't really matter because it wouldn't be mobilizing um, old carbon. Great, great answer. Uh, <clears throat> do you have data from older studies 20 years ago or even longer that you can use to understand the chain? You, know, you have your data now is there older data that you have access to that people measured so you can see changes in, in the, the, the cycling of carbon into the atmosphere? Um, it's a little bit, it's a little bit limited. Um, I think the, the Arctic has been certainly an attractive place to do research, but it's always been challenging. And it tends to be that Arctic data sets are more limited because it's harder to get there, harder to work there. The seasons are more brutal. Um, you know, we use what we can in terms of old data. There's an incredible, um, man, there's this, I used to have this, have a, an example of this in, the, in this talk, but I ended up taking it out. Um, there is an incredible data set measured by the USGS. Ah, I have this in here still. They were flying around a drill rig capable of drilling 10,000 foot wells on a C-130 in the early 80s and late 70s. And I can't even imagine this. They were in the middle of the winter, right? So it was basically completely dark out, 50 below zero, putting this drill rig on a propeller airplane and flying it around the North Slope, stopping at airstrips that somebody would go ahead of time, you know, shovel an airstrip with a bulldozer, drop this drill rig down and then drill for a couple of weeks and then see, they were looking for hydrocarbons. However, some brilliant guy, I, I, don't, I, I don't know if it was Gary Cloud that started it, but certainly Gary Cloud maintained it for a long time, um, put temperature uh, sensors in these boreholes. So you could get a sense for the permafrost thickness and what kinds of changes there were. And so that's a really cool example of an old data set where uh, we could never mobilize that kind of effort again, right? I mean, that's just unimaginable both you know, for potential impact on the landscape at the expense of <laughs> flying a drill rig around for science. Um, so yeah, that, that would be one of the, the coolest old data sets that I've had an opportunity to work with. Yeah, no, you're not doing that again. Uh, <laughs> so is, is the methane either released or in the permafrost a contributor to the wildfires? Not that I'm aware of. That's an interesting idea. Um, Yeah, because mostly it's coming out of the lakes. And if it were to, even if it were to ignite on a lake, I think it would probably, yeah, kind of be mitigated by the fact that you're in the middle of the water. Um, so yeah, I've never heard of a of lake methane 
resulting in wildfires, although it's a very, very interesting idea. And I will definitely keep my ear out for that in the future. Uh, I'm just going to repeat Bob's question word for word. What is the direction and relative value of the heat flux up from the core and down from the atmosphere? Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's basically the bottom of the permafrost, right? They, they balance out at the bottom of the permafrost. And that absolutely is how our thermal models work, is we take into account the heat flux from the, the deep heat flux. And the permafrost thickness is partially balanced by the point where you can't get enough cold from the atmosphere down to freeze any more permafrost, given how much heat is coming up from below. So I think that's kind of what you're what you're talking about. And that depth ranges from, uh, yeah, it's, it maxes out at about 600 meters deep uh, in North America, anyway. And I'm gonna I'm gonna guess that the methane released has never been in sufficient quantity to be dangerous to your researchers. Uh, no, no one's been blown up yet. <laughs> no, no, we've had eyebrows singed and hair caught on fire, absolutely, but uh, nobody's been blown up or suffocated or anything like that. Okay. Uh, so there's a lot of water up there. And to me in Northern Alaska, that means lots of birds, bugs, and maybe other interesting wildlife. Could you just comment on some of that? Well, the reason I like to work uh, in, the, in the spring when, the, when everything's frozen is because uh, there are no mosquitoes when it looks like this. <laughs> uh, there are plenty of birds. Uh, yeah, there's, there's some birds that overwinter. We are in there in the spring when you start to get some migration happening. So you can, yeah, definitely, you know, birds are, are, are a super important part of this ecosystem. Um, you know, we see all the charismatic megafauna that you'd expect. Um, grizzly bears are, uh, are on the landscape even here. They're just very, very, very sparse, right? So the carrying capacity of this landscape for a grizzly bear is like one per whatever, 50 square miles compared to, you know, Kodiak Island where it's, you know, completely reversed. Um, and caribou, of course, are, are everywhere. Um, they tend to stay away from our snow machines. So they, uh, you know, we see them running more than we see them hanging out. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an incredibly active system. Um, we always see wildlife, even when it looks like this, there's always an Arctic fox or something like that, um, or wolverine. And uh, so even though it kind of looks like a wasteland, it's, you know, it's somebody's wasteland. And, uh, you know, in addition to that, the Inupiat who are all over the place, like the old, you'll be in the middle of Nova, all of a sudden there's a whole family driving by in a snow machine. And it's like, where are you going? How did you even get here? Um, it's very, very, it's a surprisingly active place. Yeah. Andy, this was just an amazing talk. Uh, I can't wait for the field trip. And uh, thank you very, very much. It's, uh, it's really an eye opener to, to see the data, the landscape and, and the research that you're doing. So I wanna thank you from all of us here at uh, the Geologists of Jackson Hole. And uh, we, we hope to get you back in person. Uh, when, when that becomes possible. I want to remind everyone, <clears throat> uh, we're having